All right, so welcome uh, back uh, to the cardiology grand rounds. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the screen to uh, provide some of the information for the CME. Uh, cardiology grand rounds, again, continues to grow in its size and numbers. It's uh, currently uh, hosted at the YouTube website uh, where you can get the entire link of uh, previous uh, uh, series available. Uh, for the CME credit for the session, please text 14280 to the number 888-816-4893 as an SMS message uh, with a mobile phone that is in record on your active profile in the Rutgers Cloud CME platform. And this uh, again, will display the number one more time in the middle of the sessions if you uh, need the information one more time. Uh, and for the uh, MOC, uh, maintenance of certifications specifically for physicians, please complete the step one and this link, which will be again made available in the chat box, uh, would need a future 27 as a room code. Uh, and then you'll need to answer the questions correctly. And that will lead you to getting uh, MOC credits uh, directly at your ABIM ID, which is populated to your CME profile. Okay, so once more, uh, the CME credits and MOC, please make sure that you avail of this uh, for our grand rounds. For uh, today's um, grand rounds, um, we are extremely uh, happy to have uh, a, a very, uh, very uh, distinguished panel and a faculty, a friend, uh, Dr. Maganti, Kameshwari Maganti. Um, and the panel consists of uh, Dr. Robert Burke, uh, Dr. Ashok Chaudhry, and Dr. Michael Huang. So let me introduce each one of them. Uh, Dr. Uh, Maganti comes from uh, Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern. Uh, she came from India and uh, told me that uh, she was extremely influenced by uh, her mentorship uh, and a mentee relationship with Kanu Chatterjee during her formative years and subsequently has uh, uh, risen to uh, a stature in the uh, societies, the American College of Cardiology and American Society of Card Echocardiography as a person who not only everyone loves to hang around with because of her nature, but also because of her unique uh, qualities of uh, providing uh, education and mentorship to people uh, in a very effortless manner. And you will soon come to know uh, why is that the case? Because uh, she has this unique ability to provide um, communication, uh, which, is, uh, which is very friendly and very affectionate, which is very rare to find in the sense uh, in a very, um, a uh, very collegial environment. Um, that is something people really admire about her. Uh, and in fact, if, when you talk to people, she they immediately respond that she's one of the kindest souls uh, in the national society, is one of the most liked person in the society. So I think I've been very privileged to have known her for some time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, she has a, a very important role that she plays uh, at uh, uh, her academic appointment at, uh, at Northwestern University. She is uh, Associate Professor of Medicine and uh, also uh, currently is uh, uh, the Director of the Cardiac uh, uh, Rehabilitation Program, uh, Director of the Solid Organ Transplant Cardiology Program. And uh, not only that, but in the Echo Lab, everybody loves to hang around her and Make, make a lot of uh, time spent with her because it's, it's always wonderful to uh, have uh, a day spent well where Dr. Maganti is uh, teaching and, and providing the environment where people can learn uh, blissfully without much uh, stress. So that's her, that's her uh, credit. But in, that, in addition to all of that, because of her, uh, her uh, collegial nature, she has been profoundly influential in the uh, national societies, particularly uh, in the American Society of uh, uh, Cardi uh, Cardiology, uh, American College of Cardiology and American Society of Echocardiography. Uh, she is uh, currently leading the chair of, uh, as the chair of the members, membership steering committee 
Uh, she is also uh, the lead for the um, content quality and working group in the ARDMS. And she's also the uh, chair for the ARDMS uh, uh, for, her, uh, uh, for her role uh, in educational uh, activities. Uh, she, so she's uh, very well respected as a clinician uh, educator. She has committed uh, uh, her effort uh, in not only guidelines, but also uh, in, in standardizing the quality of echocardiography. And today uh, we are very uh, privileged that she uh, decided to share with her uh, with us her ex experience on, on myocardial infarction complications uh, uh, that she currently she has had compiled also as a, a review article in JAMA Cardiology. And I think I'm sure we'll go to, go, we will hear a lot about uh, some of these things from her. So welcome, uh, Kamu. Uh, so glad to have you. And I'd also like to uh, go ahead and introduce uh, uh, Bob Burke because uh, um, Bob, uh, Robert and myself go long back uh, when I was doing my fellowship in cardiology. He was completing his um, uh, uh, advanced cardiovascular imaging uh, in, in specialization in echocardiography and at Mayo Clinic Scottsdale, Arizona. Subsequently, currently, he is the director of the non-invasive cardiodiagnostic on our health uh, as a, a system in Scottsdale, Arizona. And he has had multiple leadership roles uh, and faculty roles in the health system there. And he contributes enormously uh, to the growth of the structural program in the health system. So, uh, Bob, uh, welcome and thanks to have you with us as a panelist. I know that you're going to be invited once more time, one more time to give a grand rounds uh, at a later date, and I'm sure we will have um, uh, maybe a, a little bit longer introduction for you at the time. But nevertheless, thanks for joining us today. So thank you. And then we have uh, Dr. Michael Huang, who is the co-director of the CCU, and Dr. Ashok Chaudhry, who's um, uh, our uh, assistant professor and uh, uh, also the um, uh, one of the leading person in the structural programs uh, and has a lot of work uh, that he does uh, with complex coronary interventions and structural procedures, particularly uh, device closures of complex um, uh, problems. So I think we will have a robust conversation. So now I'm going to invite uh, uh, Dr. Maganti to come and give a talk and then we will get into a uh, dialogue mode and uh, a multi-panel uh, discussion mode and, and maybe have a robust conversation. So come, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for that kind invitation. Um, I'm going to, uh, I hope I live up to all of that that Pato has said, but um, again, thank you so much, Dr. Sengupta. Um, I, today I'm just going to go ahead and talk about a topic that um, is somewhat rare, but has been noticed by, at least in the Midwest, by quite a few of the cardiologists. And um, these are one of the rarest complications that you end up seeing, but still we need to understand uh, the pathophysiology and what to do. So I love that the theme is practice to perfection. And uh, first of all, I have no disclosures pertaining to any of this educational activity. Um, what exactly does the idiom practice makes perfect mean? Amo, we are not seeing your slides. Uh, so maybe you want to just share your slides. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me go ahead and share. I apologize that I'm having a bit of an issue. Right here, I don't even see the box in the bottom. This should be it. I think, yes. hopefully, okay. yeah. Um, So I was just talking about the idiom about what exactly practice makes perfect mean. It just tells us that people become really good at something if they practice it often. And what exactly does it translate to us in medicine? And 
particularly to us in cardiology world. So it is important to have the education that is required, which actually translates to us recognizing the disease process pretty quickly once you get to see it. And that knowledge base is going to allow us to jump into the action mode so we can better take care of patients. So I really am happy to be presenting in this space because it's going to make a lot of difference uh, to our patients when we are better trained at recognizing these disease processes. So switching gears and moving directly into the mechanical complications of acute MI. Over the past 30 years, we have had significant improvements in timely reperfusions within the regionalized systems of care that has been set up as a thrust by American Heart Association. And this allowed for the advancement in optimal medical therapies and all of these have translated to reduce mortality, mortality rates of acute myocardial infarction. However, these improvements have continued to be challenged by the aging US population. And this actually comes with a higher burden of comorbidities. And these have all been identified as risk factors for post-MI mechanical complications. Although there has been a temporal decline in patients with STEMI, contemporary patients with mechanical complications, they typically are older women with a history of congestive heart failure, chronic kidney disease, and are often presenting with their first MI. And just thinking about this, it should tell us that there really hasn't been much of collateralization and maybe that is the reason why they may have more mechanical complications as well. So let us just go over the timeline of the incidence and mortality rates of the mechanical complications. Um, so if you think back uh, close to 40 years ago, the introduction of fibrinolytic therapy um, actually has shown that there is a significant decline in mortality stemming from STEMIs. So there was, uh, to, uh, compared to the pre reperfusion era, there is about 40% decrease in the fibrinolytic era. And um, this mortality somehow hasn't budged much with the primary PCI era that started in the early 2000s, despite the fact we have systems of care for STEMI as well as the shock therapies. Um, in fact, there have been some studies showing that um, if you combine fibrinolysis with GDM3, that it equals the mortality rates of primary PCI. However, the adoption of primary PCI is the preferred reperfusion strategy now we are focusing more and more on improving systems of care to maximize the proportion of patients not only receiving PCI, but also we have emphasized timely percutaneous intervention. And emergency medical services along with the hospital systems actually working together with coordinated protocols of care, mortality has been reduced. However, the mechanical complications continue to have somewhat of a flattened line. And this is something we'll continue to talk about. So what are the major mechanical complications that we're going to be talking about today? Papillary muscle rupture, as you can see in this pathology specimen, this is a complete pap muscle rupture. Ventricular septal um, rupture, which we can actually see here. And then ventricular free wall rupture, which is uh, in this pictorial right there. All of them are somewhat rare. The ventricular free wall rupture, which accounts for majority of the house of out of hospital cardiac arrest, have the highest incidence. But more or less, most of them are around 0.2, 0.1%. The unfortunate thing about these mechanical complications is it is fold more likely to 
experience in hospital mortality in the patients who have them. So recognitions become, becomes really crucial. So let us talk about free wall rupture. The true incidence is unknown. Uh, as we have talked about, it could be secondary to out of hospital sudden cardiac death. Most often there is lack of routine autopsy, so we may never know the cause. It should be suspected in any patient with hemodynamic instability or collapse after an MI, especially in the setting of delayed or ineffective reperfusion strategies. Um, sometimes it is preceded by chest pain. We may be able to see ST segment elevations because of the contact of the blood that irritates the pericardium. It's rapidly fatal. And occasionally, we may be lucky enough by doing a prompt bedside echo, along with the focus that's available these days, which can confirm the diagnosis and warrant emergency surgical correction. Um, it typically happens within the first three to seven days. And temporarily, seven days is kind of like the magic number people talk about. Um, we divide these ruptures as type 1, type 2, and type 3, the type 3 being rupture of a thin-walled aneurysm. Uh, type 1 is an abrupt tear noticed often within the first 24 hours, and type 2 is more of a slow ooze, and you can see this collection right there. Whereas in the surgical literature, um, they usually talk about a blowout pre-wall rupture versus a losing pre-wall rupture. Uh, the blowout one is a very large immediate tear, which is equivalent to the type 1 that we see in cardiology literature. It results in tamponade physiology, cardiogenic shock, and ultimately cardiac arrest. The oozing is uh, lucky enough in the sense that it requires more time. It's a smaller gradual tear. It is limited by the thrombus formation of a compliant pericardium in people whose pericardium is not significantly diseased. There is a little bit more hemodynamic stability and you end up seeing a large pericardial effusion. So now let's move to one of the cases. Mr. Kayan is a 54 year old male with prior history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who presented with three weeks of fatigue and shortness of breath. Uh, after the admission, he was noted to have this following ECG. So you can uh, see the significant ST segment elevations in the inferior leaves with reciprocal changes and in the anterolateral leaves. He underwent TCI of a dominant proximid RCA. He continued to have chest pain in the recovery area and was taken back to the lab and stent patency was noted at that point. However, the LV gram showed this. He had a very large uh, free wall rupture in the inferior. And then he had a VTRS prior to uh, surgical assessment underwent CPR with ROSC, and the bedside transthoracic echo demonstrated this. All of this was happening in the uh, cath lab soon after the procedure. He was taken directly to the uh, OR suite, underwent an emergency surgical repair, and intraoperatively, you could see that there was a perforation of this huge aneurysm that was noted, And you can see the large perforation that was right there. He underwent a super sutured patch technique to close the defect. And you, you may ask like, what are the techniques that are typically utilized? It can either be a sutured patch technique or sutureless techniques using a lot of fibrin and surgical glue. However, no matter what is done, uh, there is close to 50% in hospital mortality rate, and this is happening in front of our eyes. Medical therapy, if you go that route, there is a 90% mortality rate. And pericardiosynthesis, if you think about it, is just a temporizing measure. How much of 
uh, blood can be just removed, right? And mechanical support can be considered, but obviously the patient needs to be taken to the surgical suite. So how about ventricular septal ruptures? With delayed or no reperfusion, it can have a bimodal distribution within the first 24 hours and also between three to five days. The incidence is once again pretty low, about 0.3%. Often again seen in older women who have chronic kidney disease uh, and anterior wall MI as their first MI. Lack of hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and prior MIs, once again, due to lack of collateralization, it increases the risk of VSDs. And if you think about the pathophysiology of VSD, there is a left to right shunt with volume overload of the right ventricle, then of the left atrium and left ventricle that leads to hypertension and volume overload. The anterior and apical ischemic VSDs are due to uh, infarcts in the LAD territory. Posterior VSDs, however, are due to inferior infarcts. And with the inferior infarcts, you can have RV involvement with RV infarction, RV ischemia. The posterior VSDs are often accompanied by mitral regurgitation because of ischemic tethering. You can just understand, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as well. The posterior VSDs are much more difficult to repair because they can be really irregular. And um, putting on a patch in itself um, may or may not work due to the ischemic um, myocardium. So let us talk about this case. Mr. GW is a 55-year-old man with two days of persistent chest pain. He was found to have anterior STEMI, and his mid LAD was stented at an outside hospital, which is one of our sister hospitals. He was transferred to Northwestern four days later with a very harsh systolic murmur, pulmonary edema, hypotension. And the transthoracic echo was with poor acoustic windows, so he underwent a TEE. But on transthoracic, you can actually see this apical VSD um, with a left to right shunt. And then on the TEE, the VSD measured about nine millimeters. And you can once again appreciate the left to right shunt. He underwent a percutaneous uh, intervention because he was hemodynamically unstable. And uh, we were able to get a 16 millimeter VSD occlusion device that was inserted. And um, I think Dr. Chowdhury is absolutely familiar. This is one of our VSD occluding devices, Amplazo. Six days later, he was noted to have worsening heart failure. And on the transthoracic echo, now you can see uh, how this looks. There is an apical VSD right there. There is rocking motion of this occluder device. And there is a VSD that you can actually see even in the uh, basal aspect of this occluder device. He was intubated. He started developing renal dysfunction and surgical repair of the VSD was planned. He underwent a patch closure. Um, and let us talk about the mortality. With medical therapy, 92% mortality. So we are slowly understanding that none of these mechanical complications can do okay with medical therapies. With surgical therapy, it is in the greatest detail, but surgical therapy. Uh, surgical mortality is about, 30-day mortality is about 6%, 61%. The percutaneous options are 33%. Majority of the reason why these percutaneous options fail is because this necrotic myocardium cannot take and hold on to any of these devices. With infarct expansion, these devices can embolize. And so there is really no difference between surgery versus percutaneous intervention within uh, less than two weeks. However, these are from smaller case series. So we have to take that with a grain of salt. 
uh, medical therapies such as inotropes, diuretics are temporizing measures. So we need to think about mechanical circulatory support with a balloon pump or ECMO in unstable patients. If needed, the V ECMO or even VA ECMO is needed in some people. Surgical management is the definitive treatment, but the optical timing is unclear. So um, once again, look at the mortality rates. When you repair less than seven days versus over seven days. So a lot of the surgeons like to buy a little time. And this is where I think some of our percutaneous options may play a role. So coming back to a patient, remember he now has had a patch repair. He's doing well three years following surgery. His EF is still about 45% on GDMP. He has not had any more episodes of heart failure. Now, moving on to another mechanical complication, scapulary muscle rupture. It accounts for more than 50% of acute severe MR following an MI. The median time to presentation can be 13 hours, but most often we see them anyway, again, between three to five days. Once again, the typical patients are older women with hypertension, less of diabetes, less of prior MIs, and less of smoking. Similarly, they don't have the collateralization as we have learned with our patients. Now, um, before we move on to a case, let us talk about the perfusion to the pap muscles. Um, the anterior anterolateral papillary muscle gets blood supply both from LAD and circumflex. So the chances of having a pap muscle rupture with anterolateral MIs is a lot less as compared to postromedial papillary muscle rupture. The postromedial papillary muscle gets blood supply from a single vessel. It can either be a dominant RCA or a dominant left circumflex. Um, the papillary muscle ruptures may be partial or complete. And based on what we see, that may influence the severity of the mitral regurgitation, the symptoms, and also the surgical planning. Patients who do not initially present with cardiogenic shock commonly experience rapid hemodynamic deterioration, so we need to watch them really closely like hawks. Patients with acute MR attributable to papillary muscle rupture may require mechanical circulatory support before, the, before mitral valve surgery. Also remember the classic uh, systolic murmur that you expect to hear is not often heard because of the rapid equalization of the pressures between the LB and LA. Now to another case, Mrs. J.S. is a 66-year-old woman who was quite active in good health, had rare episodes of heartburn and an occasional smoker. She noted chest pain that became severe over one to two days prompting a visit to local emergency room, was noted to have a, an inferior steny underwent PCI to prox RCA. Due to hemodynamic instability, a balloon pump was placed and she was emergently transferred to NMH the very next day. A transthoracic echo was performed on a eval, and this is a chest X-ray that is pretty much whited out, raising a suspicion for uh, frank flash pulmonary edema. So here is a 3D on a transthoracic, and you can actually see, looking at it from the LB perspective, that these, uh, that there appears to be a rupture of the postromedial papillary muscle. And here are the 2D images, uh, once again, demonstrating this little mass that's flying in the air with pretty significant uh, mitral regurgitation. And this, the patient obviously was taken to the operating room really quickly, but these were the pre-images that were obtained. You can see the papillary muscle that is completely ruptured with significant mitral regurgitation that is directed posteriorly because it's a posterior papillary muscle rupture with tethering of the posterior mitral leaflet. 
And once again, you can see that on 3D. And the patient underwent a surgical repair. A reparative strategy was taken, which involved triangular resection of the posterior leaflet of P2 towards the P3 segment. So uh, that is uh, one of her surgeons, Dr. Pat McCarthy, who was doing the procedure. Uh, she underwent resection of the posterior medial papillary muscle, and she had a magna ease by a prosthesis and a vein graft to her RCA. The immediate post TE showed that her mitral mean gradient was one millimeter mercury. She, however, her postoperative course was extremely rocky, complicated by prolonged cardiogenic shock, uh, tons of atrial arrhythmias. She required multiple pressors, which were finally weaned off over the next two weeks, finally got extubated. And it is now four years later, she's doing really well with no heart failure symptoms. And her EF is about 50 to 55%. So once again, this is a surgical emergency. When somebody develops respiratory failure, such as pulmonary edema, it should trigger prompt surgical and short team, short team evaluation. Emergency rule use of temporary mechanical circulatory support may help a bit, but obviously the definitive uh, treatment is going to be surgery. Mitral valve replacement is utilized because this has been predictable, the durability has been established, and people surprisingly do pretty well when you take them into the operating room as soon as possible. Now, just switching gears, I know we had just about 10 minutes or so. I'll go through two very quick cases before we can get the panel to comment and uh, talk about things. Um, Mr. BS, I, I know, but it's truly BS, is a 63-year-old male with prolonged hospitalization for COVID-19 pneumonia between mid-April to end of May at an outside hospital complicated by STEMI that was medically managed. He was too ill to um, undergo anything. Um, he developed cardiogenic shock with an EF of 11% with resulting ischemic cardiomyopathy with severe LV dysfunction. Uh, he also uh, was admitted to Northwestern with recurrent cardiogenic shock because he kept going into shock multiple times. So this was the transthoracic echo on presentation. Again, these are the kinds of things we see, right? Patients are sicker, very difficult to image. And you are now seeing a horn-like projection right here and maybe wondering what exactly is that? Is that an aneurysm? Is there a thrombus? You can certainly identify very low flow state. And with the contrast that was given, you can see this huge aneurysm. Luckily, there does not appear to be any thrombus within the aneurysm. And of note, the patient is on anticoagulation. Only the basal segments seem to be contracting. And here is this left cat. Uh, pretty much like this. Near total LAD with CTO from the mid. And here is his RCA. So he underwent a cardiac MR. There was no significant viability. Uh, and you can see the scar uh, in the anterolateral area. So stenting of the LAD was deferred. He failed inotrope vein. And so he was status post axillary intraiotic balloon pump. He progressed to stage D heart failure. He's now on destination therapy with HeartMate 3. He underwent a PFO closure and an LV aneurysm repair in August of 2020. And here is his bad cannula. And again, true life, really difficult images. And here is his inlet cannula of the bad that you can see sitting at the apex. He's currently doing well. Functional status is improving. He's going to cardiac rehab. He's being considered for heart 
and likely heart kidney transplant. However, his LFTs continued to be abnormal from his COVID pneumonia. Um, Mr. GV is a 58-year-old man with history of coronary artery disease, had two stents complicated by BTRS, had an ICD in July of 2021. He has peripheral arterial disease, heart tract with significant LV dysfunction, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, medication non-compliance. Uh, classic patients that we all love to take care of who presented with abdominal pain for three days. And here, this raises a suspicion that there may be obviously significant amount, significant amount of thrombus in the LA, uh, LV apex instead of having a TP kind of apex. Now we have this flattened hat that this LV is bearing. And even without contrast, you can actually see the amount of thrombus that this patient has in this um, aneurysm. He refused any medical or interventional therapies and once again was lost to follow up. So in conclusion, early revascularization has reduced the incidence of mechanical complications. However, when they do occur, the presentations are quite dramatic with acute hemodynamic instability and they require urgent recognition. In the absence of other factors that preclude any intervention, urgent percutaneous or surgical treatment needs to be undertaken. Surgery is the definitive mode of treatment. Interest and experience in acute percutaneous therapies continue to grow and you keep noticing that there are shorter case series that are getting presented day by day. And I'm hoping that the percutaneous therapies will actually buy us time before the surgery becomes the definitive answer uh, for all of these patients. Just a couple of other things that I think we really have to think about is the multidisciplinary team-based approach to decision-making. When you come up with shared decision making, uh, it has been shown to increase the collaboration, communication, uh, standards of care, improving GDMP, uh, as well as improving patient survival and outcomes. So it really is important for us to have a good shock team um, in place. In most cases, the mechanical complications are surgical emergencies. So the surgeons need to be really very closely involved uh, to avoid any undue delays for medical optimization. And this is one of the treatment pathways that has been suggested to prevent uh, mechanical complications. And I think this is very doable. Once again, it depends on a good heart team discussion. The shock team should be involved from the get-go. A heart team needs to be involved. Um, and then the surgeon, it is made up of surgeons, interventionalists, cardiologists, imagers, uh, pharmacy staff. Um, so all of these things need to be thought out. And I think like uh, Dr. Singh Gupta wanted us to think about practice makes perfect. This is what we need to have in place and continue to practice so we can reduce um, any kind of complications and improve the mortality in this critically ill population. And thank you so much uh, for uh, all of you listening in. Um, these are just the fall colors that we are seeing right now. And yesterday was the Chicago Marathon where more than 40,000 people have run. I couldn't, I couldn't be the race leader. Typically, I end up being at the finish line at the tent, but I couldn't do it yesterday since I was on teaching service. So. Um, it was amazing. Uh, yesterday was a great day for these runners. So it's back in action. So I thank you for that. Thank you for your attention. So we have the first hand in the call. All right. So I think we just uh, got um, uh, Dr. Navina Yanmala running into my door uh, because there's an entry wall in my uh, that's getting triggered for probably STEM IDTU trial. So anyway, but that's why they were very excited. So that's the unload trial. Um, so they were trying to um, work towards that. You know, that's the one of the pivotal trials that, that they're trying to look into of how do you reduce the stress on the LV wall. Um, but anyway, so uh, Kamu, this was excellent overview. Thank you very much. 
now let's become a little bit more uh, practical and pragmatic, okay? Um, we have post-COVID burnouts, sonographer shortage. What is happening in Northwestern for getting an echo done in the nighttime? When a STEMI comes, what is an average time to get an echo? What should be an average time to getting an echo done? Um, when does it get done? And if not, why should we not be doing pocket ultrasound? Why AI guided focus, which you guys have uh, pioneered is not a solution. So I'm just throwing it out there because mechanical complications cannot happen without imaging. You know, you, you don't have the window. Right. No, that's, a, that's an excellent question. But the sonographer shortages, uh, we have ultimately ended up getting uh, a lot of the agency sonographers too. So we have a total of 32 sonographers. Uh, we do have a few agency and a lot of people decided from agency over the past year to become uh, part of the group, which has been really great. We are always continuing to hire more people. It has always been the case that when somebody needs a middle of the night echo for any reason whatsoever, we get in a sonographer right away because they are on call. Uh, it's partly because of two things. Uh, Fellows are fantastic at doing focus, but the absolute knowledge base of being able to get the accurate images that would serve the patient, it may not always happen. And so for the better care, we usually get our fellows to still do their focus, but we have a sonographer who comes in right away. We usually expect them to be in the hospital within 30 minutes after they get activated. We, if I'm the uh, reader of the night or, or uh, on call, I'm called right away and I'm going to read it from home. Uh, I immediately let the fellow know how to go with this, what needs to be done. So yesterday when I was on call, there was somebody who had um, who developed myocarditis soon after a cardiac transplant. And obviously we needed to get the shock team involved. Uh, the surgeons were absolutely involved. So uh, it, it had moves very quickly. So that's how it's been set up uh, at this institution. Very interesting. So um, maybe I'll invite Bob to um, give his perspective of what he has seen in Arizona. So similarly, we have sonographers on call 24-7, uh, so that's not a real barrier. Uh, we've been fortunate. You were experiencing some latency. Um, so we'll see if you can resume back. Um, if, if Bob is not uh, resuming back, I heard that I think they also have a 24-7. Uh, very interesting. So we we do still continue to have a lot of struggle with sonographer. Maybe we need to think about how do we uh, have a sonographer backup plan during the night time. So that's a, that's something I come will certainly be interested to explore. Can I, can I comment there, Dr. Sengupta, yes. on that? Because you know, because I, I work at community hospitals like Princeton and St. Peter's, and um, I have an example of a STEMI that I did. You know, maybe a year or so ago, and you know, I fixed the I forgot which vessel was uh, probably LED. And, you know, I, I didn't listen to her, but when I brought her up to the ICU, the intensivist listened to her. And he's like, Mike, I hear a really loud, harsh murmur. I was like, oh man, okay, it's either gotta be MR or VSD. So I called the, you know, sonographer on call. She came in, she did the proper test. I read it, VSD. So I went, you know, put a balloon pump, talked to the surgeons at Robert Wood, shipped it over. So if it was at Robert Wood, if we needed a, you know, a stat echo, you know, would it be done by, by a, either myself or a, fellow and I don't think we'd be able to find that VSD. You know, I could swan it and find it, but um, but at community hospitals it's 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 done, you know, um, with the proper care. Yeah, so I think uh, that's what I was saying, Mike. Uh, we need to develop a, um, a plan in which we can um, I think it's patient care first. So, right, it's not that we, you and I cannot, we can do that, fellows can do that. But I think when sonographers do the quality of, like Dr. Magadhi was saying, that the quality of the image is far yeah. more uh, crisp. And I think there's a certain uh, uh, degree of um, uh, accountability on trying to get it done in time and all that. So, which is wonderful. Um, 
so I think we need to move towards that. So now let me ask you, Kamu, in that light, same light. Um, so when you do your, um, uh, so your, all your STEM is, I'm sure, get your echoes done, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there's this push to uh, send patients early, ambulate and send early. And some of these complications actually happen at 48, 72 hours. So um, is that, I mean, I'm sure that uh, maybe some of the high-risk cases stay longer, but maybe some of the uh, pre-wall ruptures or papillary muscle ruptures may happen during that window and the patient is almost in the time of uh, getting discharged. How do we uh, get away from committing an error like that? So one of the good things, if they have lived long enough to hit the hospital, is that they're going to be on GDMP. They're going to have some kind of definitive therapy that's going to keep them here, hopefully uh, protected. So in that way, uh, when I'm talking about, say, a free wall rupture, that is going to be really difficult to predict. But if somebody has a very large MI with the troponins being in 100,000 or more, I'm sure we're going to keep them here longer, but just the fact that they're going to be on aspirin, a statin, a beta blocker, I'm hoping would actually reduce some of these complications. But again, you know, I think some of those may be unpredictable because if it's going to happen seven days uh, later after we discharge the patient, I, I don't know if there is any set path in which we could think about uh, putting these patients in. Uh, for example. Yeah, and, and maybe uh, maybe I will ask Ashok this question. So Ashok, we do get a lot of patients who come delayed uh, and they get delayed PCIs or they will get first thrombolized and then we get PCIs. Not sure, anecdotally, have you seen a little bit more complication rates in these kind of patients? Because uh, it will, unfortunately, we being a tertiary center, we tend to get some very late cases. No, no, that's that's true. I think the classic example we have, uh, like most other centers, is the rise of all these uh, post-infarct VST, post-infarct MR during COVID time, right? Because patients deliberately stayed home. And in the past, we used to see once or twice a year, but in the span of several months, we saw several VSTs, like three or four of them uh, come in. And most of them were presenting late, three, four days late. So I think the index of suspicion for complications of those patients are high. And uh, to your point, I think if you have someone who looks much more sicker than they should look on the table, you know, as an interventionist, we have a road threshold of putting a swan in and, and trying to figure out why, whether it's a VST or MR, uh, especially if you are doing a case in the middle of the night where there may be lack of support of imaging. And that way, you know, you can probably diagnose them. But yes, we, uh, like most centers, I'm sure, uh, as in New York, we also saw a big rise of cases uh, uh, during the COVID time, especially at presenters. And, and what is our experience with, um, I mean, I, I mean, I have followed this data for a very long time. I've not been a fan of post-VSD device closure. Typically, I've not seen, um, I mean, I've seen some people do okay, but most of the time it stretches and mm -hmm. not been able to see a great result. And there's always some residual shun. But what's been your experience here? Um, so, uh, yeah. So I think there's always a big controversy as to what is the uh, best way. I think it's uh, the the controversy is not whether it should be closed or how it should be closed. I think the biggest controversy lies when you close it. Uh, and, and we typically keep on saying the longer you wait, the better it is. Well, it's a natural selection bias. People who make it up to seven days is going to make it up 14 days, make it up to 21 days. If you repair three weeks later, the mortality is going to be 15%. If you repair within one day, the mortality is going to be 60%. Um, there was, I think that recently there was a registry data that came out of the United Kingdom looking at the procrastinate closure and the surgical closure. And what, what is interesting is uh, most of the patients who underwent uh, device closure were uh, surgical turned down, so they were very, very sick. So their in-hospital in mortality was higher than surgical closure, so like close to 60% versus 50%. However, if, uh, if they made it out of the hospital, overall five-year survival were similar. And to your point, in, even in that registry data, the, uh, the average wait uh, time period that they waited before anyone closed either by surgery or device was at least eight days. 
So you, you don't see like closure happening within one day, two day uh, surgery or device because you know it's, it's the whole tissue is very mushy. And I was I was talking before we started um, that the uh, the problem with the VST is the size. Apical VSTs, yes, they're usually smaller, and then maybe you may have a nice stream that you can try to close. But posterior VSTs, they are very serpiginous, they are very mushy. And the biggest VST occluder size, we have a separate post infarct VST occluder, and the biggest waste we have available is 24. Um, the if compared to contrast to AST sizes, the biggest AST size we have is 38. And to put a 24, you know, you want uh, adequate amount of oversizing as well. So you're looking at maybe 1.5 centimeter defect that you may be able to close if you're lucky with a 24 device. And as you know, most most often these these uh, these holes are pretty big. So a uh, classic example that the one she presented, you may have a good result in day one, but you may have you know uh, the the device may embolize and and. Uh, we may have more VSD just while doing the pushes itself as well. I think the biggest uh, role for this posterior VSD may be the residual VSD that you see after a surgical repair. The surgeon goes in, puts in a VSD, and there is some residual defect, then maybe you can close it as well. And in cases where the surgeon says no, uh, despite adequate mechanical support, you may be able to buy some time. Maybe put in a device uh, that reduces the shunt give them a few more days, six, seven days, and then uh, hopefully we have a better outcome. But these patients do very uh, poorly, uh, no matter what you do, but if you don't do anything, they eventually die. Yeah, uh, that's very, uh, that's very um, intriguing. Uh, one more area which I find um, uh, very uh, troubling, troubling. So we have uh, post PCI, we do PCI uh, for all patients. But the no flow, so low flow intramyocardial hemorrhage and, and tissue uh, infarction uh, still happening despite a successful uh, PCI being done in a, uh, in a large interval MI is fairly frequent. I'm, I think we need to see how the unload trial plays out because the final infarct size ultimately is the uh, determinant of how uh, things play out. But uh, Mike, I wanted to ask you, um, we do see a lot of patients who are typically in the LCX territory or RCA have 100% occlusion, but then don't have ST elevations, right? So they present with non-ST elevation AMIs and typically will end up having 24 or 48 hours, then they get their PCIs. And we have not been able to identify these subsets of people uh, because if you wait for the troponin number, sometimes people just look at the rising troponin and maybe want to take them earlier. But I do get worried that these are actually STEMI equivalents uh, and you're not treating them just because the ST is not going up, but their artery is 100% occluded. Any thoughts, Mike? I'm not sure if you're encountering uh, these patients uh, in the CCU um, uh, or what's what's been the- I mean, absolutely, as an intervention, we've done STEMI call for <laughs> 10 years. You get these borderline, borderline inferior wall ST elevations. And you know they'll send you the EKG you're like oh I don't know and then I, I I'm I'm now kind of experienced enough to say how does that patient look? Do they, do they look terrible? Do they look like they're having an MI? You know and really it's it's how the patient um, looks and you gotta you gotta have an index of suspicion because you're right I mean these the inferior wall big RCA sometimes you don't show the ST elevations and if you wait you're just you're just kind of you're, you're letting them develop these risk of these mechanical complications. And, 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 yeah, and maybe, and that's where in these kind of cases, an early triage with a uh, ultrasound, uh, maybe a pocket ultrasound, if you see a large area of wall motion abnormality, maybe you will be interested to take that patient quickly yeah. to the lab than waiting around. And I think maybe that's a service we could try to do. Um, I don't know, uh, maybe I, I want to bring to Bob into picture because now I can see him more clearly. Uh, I think he seems to be uh, able to, let's see if you can connect and. I, do you use point of care ultrasound in your uh, health system there, or? I, yeah, I it's know. it's ubiquitous right now. Uh, point of care ultrasound is in the emergency department. It is in the ICU. Um, it really is something that most of our students are actually becoming facile with as part of their basic training. So even before they get into residency, we have students that are using point of care ultrasound while they're on their ICU rotations. So I think that is going to be a game changer 
but it's going to take several years before that really becomes standard of care and where, you know, people will view it much as we now view a stethoscope. And that's yeah, really cool. Yeah, and, and Kamo, I struggle a little bit because, um, I mean, as much as the point of care, I love it, but still, uh, wall motion is a not easy a task to standardize and someone could easily, maybe we could look into AI to develop some wall motion analysis. Well, software. that would be necessary. And, you know, I'm not trying to throw out a specific brand or anything like that, but realistically, having an AI program that would basically yell at you if things aren't normal would be helpful. It doesn't have to say what the problem is, you know, and it's just, is it good or bad? Is this normal or not normal? Because you're absolutely right. We have physicians in cardiology training who don't get wall motion right. And if it's not a glaring defect, then we get into trouble. Uh, you know, if somebody has an EF of 10 or has an EF of 80, you know, both of those sides of the spectrum, I think everybody's going to be concordant with. But if it's, if it's borderline or if there's just a window that we don't have, and I think that was brought up earlier as far as having fellows versus sonographers, you need to see all the windows and you need to make sure that there's at least some kind of protocol so that we're not led astray thinking that things are normal when they're really not. Yes. And uh, Kamu, I mean, I know that Northwestern has uh, the AI fellowship, one of the rare uh, institutes in the country that, and you have, uh, you all are pioneering a lot of work in uh, imaging and AI. How, how are you using the point of care ultrasound? Is, there, is that being used or is this more in research right now? Oh, no. Uh, focus is being used across the spectrum from emergency room, from critical care in the CCU, um, our medical students also are using them. And what is somewhat interesting is um, AI actually is pretty good at looking at wall motion, um, which is really interesting. And there is some early work that is getting done. Um, and I think once it becomes popularized, I think that's going to be a true game changer. One of the things to, to think about, and this is pertaining to your previous question about non stemmy slash STEMIs or the borderline cases, we were using, you know, the grace scores we have been looking at. So that is something that I love to use. I make people use the grace score based on what we push for the early revascularization, because the current guidelines for non STEMIs also say you can either do the early less than 24 hour versus delay, whereas European guidelines are really good at it. They really want you to intervene within the first 24 hours. So the gray scores, at least when I'm on service, have been really helpful. And I usually push for earlier revascularization because the outcomes are so much better. Yeah, it's very interesting, uh, Kamu, that uh, I just recently wrote a grant and it's almost uh, along the same lines. And one of the areas of my interest has been to look into the ultrasound texture, because remember in ultrasound, we don't diagnose the infarct size. Uh, although we know that the, the myocyte color and texture changes, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done to come closer to MRI. But, uh, but imagine if there was a way for us to show the infarct size or, or, a or infarcted tissue or infarct at risk, uh, myocardial tissue at risk. Um, objectively and even provide some uh, probability or if you would say, then maybe maybe we could move away from just simple ECG now and biomarkers to ECG biomarkers and some imaging to push some of these people faster uh, for their PCIs. And, and obviously uh, now we are, uh, you know, cardio protection using STEM IDTU, uh, I mean, Impella and other, are all the other, things that, how do we reduce the infarct size finally from developing? So these are all important areas of research because I think the work in AMI somehow seems to get, is becoming stagnant. After the primary PCI, there has not been really be, been a bigger, even if you do a primary PCI, still you get an infarct size, you know? I mean, it's not that you you don't have a completely live mind. You do have an infarct in myocardium. Some of these people end up remodeling and developing heart failure. So 
So the whole field has kind of become stagnant and we need to see where we can move the needle a little bit more. Any other closing comments from anyone uh, else? Because this has been uh, this is a very open area of conversation and we have certainly a multidisciplinary group of people and uh, certainly a shock team is an initiative that we need to move forward with. Uh, but having the right people to drive it is important. Uh, heart failure and uh, interventional people and the whole, it's a team spirit. I, I just want to mention, yeah, I just want to mention one quick thing about the uh, post-infarct MR. You know, it's a wide spectrum. You have uh, whole papillary muscle rupture to just papillary muscle dysfunction. And most of them are actually papillary muscle dysfunction. So I think, you know, uh, instead of just saying that surgical is the definitive treatment for those cases, which till now they have been, I think uh, we, we, we should not discount the fact that some of them may be may be less invasive and may tolerate sicker patients, uh, the option of transcatheter repair using a clip um, if, uh, if it's not necessarily uh, a full muscle tear that may be difficult to grasp because uh, there, there have been registries data and there is some you know, case reports looking at those very sick critical ill patients on carcinic shock that you can actually do a definitive repair uh, with the transcatheter technology. So I think it's more of a heart team discussion than just uh, a cardiologist or surgeon or heart, heart failure doctor. Like you said, I think it involves a, a shock team and a heart team uh, to make a right distance for the very sick patients. And, and, and just, I think this on, on that note, um, I, I think what the carry home message is that a phenotyping of a patient on the table as you're uh, completing a, your PCI is very important. If you're not very sure about the pulse, if, if you're not very clear about the hemodynamics, have very low threshold to put a swan, get the numbers, right? Get the imaging, get all the data because you better have the information when the patient is still in the cat lab. Whatever you have to do, I think it'll be much better than the pa sending the patient off and then having to bring back. I mean, so I think if our interventional colleagues and our fellows in training is that don't lose an opportunity to get imaging or cat numbers, uh, uh, right heart numbers, if there is a need, if you feel there is any unequivocal. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, imaging is available. I think sometimes, um, even if you don't have sonographer, if you can take some pictures and keep it, it could still be very useful. Uh, and uh, certainly, um, uh, I remember uh, that, uh, you know, it, it is not easy to get an image on a patient on the table. Um, but I, I know of some times where, you know, you may not even need to do an LB gram. So if someone has al already had a lot of contrast and you're worried about uh, dial load and all, you can actually substitute it with an, with an image on the table and, and not have to do an LB gram. Or in fact, sometimes when you do an LB gram, you do a half-hearted LB gram. So you don't see anything sometimes. Uh, and I've seen that also happen. It's of not, not much use, but or, uh, I mean, I know of uh, some of our interventional menti mentors, they would say that, why do you want to put the right heart uh, catheter into the LV and do an LV gram? That was never, it's never was advocated for that, but it became somehow a norm. Uh, it was always a pigtail, but, um, I mean, but a lot of people use it. But anyways, uh, getting more information is useful. So thank you very much, everyone. And this was uh, really enjoyable. Thank you, Kamal, Michael, uh, Bob, and Ashok for, uh, uh, for the information. And I think this field is continuing to evolve and more to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Take, much. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.